a smile for you, Jeff. Still there. So you're the source of the banquet. Yeah. <laughs> Although you seem to be source also of the well. <laughs> yeah, I'm the bad guy. <laughs> no, I thought, um, I mean, reading the book and actually knowing you, Patrick, for 12 years, I was following up on what Jeff was talking about. I think the, the book, for, for a lot of reasons, is a book of today. And I thought that one of the things that was really interesting, especially since you highlight Lumen so much, is maybe one of the people that was kind of influential to him, which was Bateson. Because mm. he was basically saying something that was more about the whole notion of the story. He said, the stories are the royal road to the study of relationships. What's important in a story what is true is not the plot, the things, or the people in the story, but the relationships between. And in a certain way, he was trying to tease out uh, this whole idea about the logic as an essential tool. And he was kind of arguing towards the end of his life, anyhow, that we got a lot of mileage out of it. For 2,000 years or so, it's what was dictated. The trouble is, he says, when you apply it to crabs, portises, butterflies, the logic doesn't do. And he says, because the whole fabric of living things is not put together by logic, you see circular trains of causation, but as you always do in the living world, the use of logic will walk you into paradoxes. And I think one of the things that's happened, and in particular when we're discussing the book with the students and also in the studio, is, is the paradox that actually a book like this actually is. Because for me, anyway, it seemed like it was very much a personal book in terms of uh, very almost a very manifesto calling for a certain attitude that architecture should exhibit and a certain autonomy that it wants to actually claim. But in doing so, it sort of teased out a lot of issues by the very fact that I think you're trying to make all of these things into some form of unified theory, which basically makes the question if that's necessary or even something advantageous. I mean, as an act, I mean, I think it's very powerful because it's obviously been a provocation to people. But I thought like the whole aspect of writing the book, I mean, it seemed that there was a lot of personal anecdote in it. And in a certain sense, it was kind of bringing up some things that the Smithsons were talking about, which they discussed in a certain sense about the act of writing, which is mostly to make ourselves aware how we have gotten in the inescapable present and to give interpretation of those same ruins, to give a glimpse of another aesthetic. And we're basically suggesting that a lot of the things were hidden to us, and design was actually being articulated through the act of actually trying to systematize something. But maybe the system itself, that was its virtue, and to sort of tease out a kind of situation about certain things, because I think for many reasons, the more I was looking at the text, the less it was about the actual text. <coughs> because you do highlight a whole series of different kinds of issues from the distinctions between art and design, and that's obviously something, a very recent phenomenon. But I, you know, there was a moment where I just kept thinking about something that Mies was talking about, when you start to state or define an epoch, and he mentioned something that architecture depends on an epoch. It's not a fashion, not is it something for an eternity, but it's part of an epoch. To understand an epoch means to understand its essence and not everything you see it. But what is important in an epoch is a very difficult to find out because it's the slow unfolding of the great form. The great form cannot be invented by you or by me, but we are working on it without knowing it. And when this great form is fully understood, the epoch is over, then there's something new. That's just how I see it. And I just think it's kind of interesting, I think, at this stage of the moment to see your belief in terms of theory's critical role in practice and why, let's say, this book today, in a certain sense, teases out very particular kinds of responses, which is, one, a complete dismissal of it, or two, a kind of proposition for a certain form of architecture. Because when you look at the actual people that you cite in the index, someone like Christopher Alexander to Jeff, this kind of synthesis of all of these people, in a certain sense, the attempt to do that, I think, 
is a noble one in a certain form, but I think it, it does sort of beg the question, the need for it which I think is not the need that is more about discursive, but it seems like the book is an action. And that action is actually trying to tease out a kind of uh, shared platform in terms of discussion. I mean, you mentioned about the Bartlett and you mentioned about other things about education and the bankruptcy of it. I think it would be interesting to actually pull that point out a bit further just to actually understand what that really means. Because for the Smithsons, they were really trying to look for something without rhetoric. And for Mies, in a certain sense, he was just basically saying he's part of a system. Even if you're not fully aware of it, you're basically articulating it through practice. And in a certain sense, you've decided to write this text, two volumes, which I think is trying to give some coherence in it. But by doing that, it also leaves out a lot of things. And those kind of things are the things that maybe some people would say is the innovation or let's say the stimulus for, let's say, further growth and evolution. And I'm just trying to understand, let's say, from a personal point of view as a colleague who we work together, how you see the text. If it's a text for you of today, trying to critically assess a moment in time, or if this is something that you actually see is something that will live outside of this. I mean, the people and the faces and the text will change. I think maybe that was my only point. I, I think the arguments behind it, or even the arguments of Lumen, are, are very much based on a kind of attitude that was very abstract, very different from other cybernetic features, or even Bateson himself, who made a big part of his argument on the ecology and the environment as being a, a feature that really teased out the autopoiesis and you've, you've mentioned a lot of the people, but you focus solely on the social communication aspect of it, which I think Jeff is kind of alluding to, has certain features of it. And part of those reasons was, for Lumen, that was never an important part of his theory. He looked at societal systems as systems themselves, that not necessarily looking at them as human communication. And I think this is where the discussion about the role of design then starts to become very interesting because you make the distinction between art and some of the things you've talked about, this expressive sketching of, let's say, Zaha or the blind time drawings of wolf pricks and so forth. And I think this is where somehow the paradox lies. If there's a need to actually overly articulate this or if in a certain sense can you pull back a little bit and start to see, you know, how it can function on a much larger practice, because I just kept getting caught up with a lot of the details, with a lot of the points, which were points on top of points. And at the end of this, uh, to be honest, with this reading it in the last couple of days, it, it formalized itself, but with so many details that at some moment the overall plot was somehow lost for me. And I'm not saying that that's something that other people share, but it's just something within the context also of us teaching that is kind of important to sort of tease out and communicate a bit. Well, the, uh, let me come in on a few points. That's quite a lot. Thanks. I mean, the overall plot is verified through its fertility in revealing and cracking and giving detailed guidance on lots of lots of details and issues. And here's one thing. You can, the overall uh, structure cannot be looked at and assessed by itself. It is what it delivers and the fertility of its working through. And uh, that's why, in the end, you had, had to pick a loop.
human as the most compelling system to tag onto. And first of all, we have to recognize we as architects, through raising ourselves within society, we have to rely on prior work, not only in architectural theory, but the theorists as a kind of exchange mechanism. We have to read philosophy and social theory. If you have a leadership claim with respect to representing an avant-garde, guiding important segments of schools, having hundreds of students, telling them what to do, what not, how to develop, criticizing them, but also in terms of the, and that's the personal aspect, uh, the kind of uh, taking the responsibility of leading a firm which is now nearly 400 people on many, many projects and wanting to uh, see these projects succeed, be satisfied, uh, um, but also having a significant contribution in the, in the long term, that makes you, um, that requires, I think, that you ask, is, this a, is there a need for unified theory? I think I need that to feel responsible about, about and not going around and telling one group this year something and the next year I'm, I'm, I'm sending people into a different direction and they keep colliding and, and uh, annihilating each other's work. And if I'm developing a master plan and, I, and, and three years later I think it's boring now and I'm, I'm, I'm ripping through my own master plan, what's that? I mean, you know, you can't progress like this. And I think uh, that's why also, uh, so, so that's the first point, that in a sense it's, it's personal to the extent that I'm kind of reflecting and taking responsibility for my own career and I think my, what I've been promoting, what I've been working on, how I've been communicating with people is consistent with that theoretical account. There's a kind of degree of honesty and also I had to let go of certain things. I had to take, reckon with certain key decisions in my life, for instance, to, to not, uh, I mean, to, to change my politics and the relationship of politics to architecture where I was for, in my youth as, it were, as, a, as an ardent Marxist, uh, um, um, trying to see architecture as a you know, critique and, and of course in, 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 in the reality of my choices and how I've been working was a different one. And, but I, this was because I felt these were the more vital arenas, uh, more justifiable, in the end more satisfying. And I'm, in a sense, have to trust your intuitions, but then take account of them. The same with aesthetic sensibilities, which, which you have, you trust, you invest in. But you shouldn't invest in them blindly, just take them as a fact. I like this stuff, and I'm going to do this stuff. That's irresponsible. It doesn't hold up uh, in, a, in a debate. You can't say this when you, when you, when you present the project to an audience, to a jury, you know, that, that just simply is, 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 is not acceptable. And to a certain extent, um, Can I yeah. Uh, it's a question I actually want to ask. Yeah. I, I was, I, and I think it was quite a wonderful sort of comment that you made. When you say you, you see projects and you want to be satisfied, do you ever go back a year, two, three years later and test them? Because there's nothing in our structure that asks us to go back and yeah. verify. Since we don't verify our promises and claims, we're either utterly irresponsible or we have a mechanism of verification or production of effects which doesn't require ex post facto verification and testing. And, uh, you know, so th I think Taylor has asked you an incredibly interesting question, and that is how rational, you know, Kant said, why, oh, reason, why can't you be reasonable? I mean, you're at, you, and the fact that you have this, com you've confessed this interestingly person, this drive for consistency. Like, I don't like the fact that I could appear one audience one day. Then I think about something like Wittgenstein, who's the, one of the greatest philosophers of all time, precisely for changing his opinion. So I'm curious about this, the desire for consistency, but also this claim to efficacy that not only you, but none of us ever test, and either there's something wrong with our discipline, and we need to fix it, or there's something right about the way we understand our results and we haven't articulated it yet. Well, I, I agree with you. Um, I think that's what comes into play here is the difference between avant-garde and mainstream. The manifesto project doesn't have to function necessarily in its real condition fully. It has more of a, like the Rietfeld house, I don't care if the Rietfeld family is well, well taken care of there. It's just a manifesto statement of a new space which, which radiates out. And a lot of our projects have been like this. But if, if you go into kind of very big commercial, retail, residential parts of the city of everyday life, 
yes, there it arrives and you, and you, and you check. And the, I think there are some prob projects of arrival where, where I would be, um, I could still take the stance, well, these are promises for future efficacy. I'm still on a kind of, I need tolerance to push this project, but I can argue for the direction, but I think the, pro the BMW project also arrived. Functions, works, has been taken up, is for me a kind of um, um, validated uh, project, high performance project. But that, that's in terms of the post-occupancy. Um, and I think the more you avant-garde, the less this is relevant because you, you, you're not claim, making claims of being uh, on the spot, state of the art, succeeding high performance. You just show new future potentialities. But these potentialities need to be in the right direction. And, and that's why it's what is important to, to get g the gist of contemporary society and its requirements, where you're saying communication intensifies. Uh, our lives are kind of much more f fluent and multitasking and full of dense communications and simultaneities. And space needs to recognize that. You need to have high density, intricate, complex environments, but the complexity has to be legible, so navigating them quickly. So there's a whole series of criteria which, which make sense with respect to what I call post forest networks society. But whether the individual project delivers this, you know, it, you know is a question. You have to, you have to give tol methodological tolerance to these. Um, so that's, yeah. you're sure about the direction, in fact, what you want to do is precisely the opposite of what you said, which is to send people in different directions, which leads to the other point of Kipnis, which is really not a very good point about testing it as if it's a drug, and you have to make sure it works. It depends what you think you're testing. But don't test poetry. So it depends what you think you're doing. So I think we're confusing an administrative need in a professional practice with an exploratory need, which is, which is forever, should be, investigatory. And the only way I can see to test it is to test it in contradiction to another perspective, not to homogenize it, in order to make sure that 29 guys are not confused with a 30th guy, and the whole thing unravels, which might be exactly what you need. It's a very interesting point. I mean, I think it's all a question of balance and, and of the degree of innovation which is consistent with an overall what we call design research project and a sense of cumulative research. I think, that, like me said, you can't invent a new architecture every Monday morning. You, 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 you can go in, this, the discipline goes into a state of browsing, freewheeling confrontations and then a selection process. And you select for a reason. And then you must commit to ask additional questions about this branch of p potential futures. That's exactly what happened when, when we move from a kind of um, fa pure surface geometries flowing in free space to questions of structure, to question of program, to questions of aperture, to question of tessellating. You know, we've been, on, in terms of what I then call parametricism, you've observed precisely this, and you have certain axiomatics you'll never go back upon. Yes, we demand of each project that it has contextual sensitivity, that it registers and interarticulates with its environment and it lets its external differentiation radiate out, out to its exterior. There's a number of values we all agree. There's ways to criticize a design as crude because it's too much repetition in it, crude because it still works with hermetic, uh, um, hermetically sealed platonic figures which are insensitive to both internal further divisions versus asymmetries in the environment. We've rejected that. It's not, and, and that's important, epoch, it's not eternity, 
but it's also not fashion. This attitude, well, I've done this for a while, I'm getting bored with this, now I want to do something else. This, I think, a very kind of bankrupt stance or de degenerate stance. And I think we need to look at... And I agree, I agree with the following. I think you have to, my feeling is, on the one hand, I'm observing the convergence. On the other hand, I observe ideologically a preponderance and dominance of this kind of free for all, anything goes, creativity is the top value, radical questioning every Monday morning, don't do this the same next year, what you're working. That's, that's, I think, the, and that needs to be rebalanced. I think if we were, your criticism that I'm kind of homogenizing, that's not where we are. We need degrees of further conversion and disciplining because we are still, I think, in, in respect to the avant-garde and some schools in the era of unsustainable. It's a, it's a, and at the same time, I'm saying in the contemporary era, let me finish this, each project, the difference is there is more innovation required. Each project is new in terms of its brief and challenges. There's no rep much repetition. Every project has new challenges, so we're confronted with, the, with new com more complexity, more novelty. Each, the concept of a project implies each project has degrees of originality and, and, and innovation in it. It's inbuilt, but, but it's, it's but cumulative, cumulative. You're not, you're not going 180 degrees. You, yeah. 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 What you talk about a new project every day is probably more like a new genre. I mean, your idea of a unified dialectic architecture, it's like music. You know, there were there for most of music's history there were very few styles and they competed with each other in a dialectic fashion. We live in a world today, not where there's a new project every day because people are getting bored, but because of the sensitivity of music to small and smaller community differences, you see a proliferation of genres. And you do that because of the abundance of resources, you know, and so the camera yeah, period. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not so sure, like, I don't know someone who changes their mind every day. I do know other people that pick up fat. The numbers of style today, and I think style is exactly the right, it's not the same thing as the number of different projects. Mm -hmm. There's yeah, sure, a lot sure. of them. Yeah. But the people that work on those stay fairly consistent within them. Now, I think it would be incumbent upon you to show how those styles might be misdirected in their ambitions, for example, or ham -fisted. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, I think at that point you really have to demonstrate more critically, more specifically. You can't. The a priori cannot be that they're all equal and to be treated equal, equal that's rights. True. To insist, I, I, insist on their kind of. And I think that's lazy. That's self-indulgent. That's unsustainable. Therefore, the question becomes: the line them up, line them up, and and criticize them, compare them with with regard to their versatility to cater for. Uh, complex context, the versatility for cater for complex programs, and of course each project is certain different. And we're looking the avant-garde, looking at the most advanced arenas of contemporary world society, and we're not going. Of course, you can still do a neoclassical villa for for for, for pr private retired uh, somebody in the countryside. That's not the challenges which a new architecture is facing. The question is who is delivering the most compelling, convincing new Google campus in downtown uh, San Francisco, and, and which is productive, which is attuned to uh, the, the, the high productivity, the most advanced forms of social intercourse. That's what the challenge is, and I know that, and, and, and on which scale, I know that minimalism falls short, and I can make a kind of polemic comparison between the, uh, the heuristics and principles and predilections of minimalism, and I know it can't deliver high-performance, complex, rich, urban uh, environments. And therefore, I, and I need to be allowed to do that. And we know that collage has been over... You know that. Well, just, just commit to it, what you're already doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe yeah. that the potentialities and the poetics are already there when we finish. And so we don't need to go back and take a poll. And, you know, because actually our audience is not those people. Are exactly what you said. We are setting potentialities that radiate from the building out in, in ineffable directions. You know, 
but I do think you know you, you can't pick a straw dog and win the argument by killing the straw dog. You have to compete with other avant-garde practices that are not consistent with your parametric arguments. Or, you know, that, yeah. And, that you and I can take on somebody like Graham who is refusing to to allow a, uh, a formal discourse to flourish as a strand in the research and that's refuses true, to and that, 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 that he's, he's chopping off his, you know, one side, one, one of his yeah, two arms. Hang on, yeah. hang on. I mean, I'm not here to defend Ram, but I think yeah. Ram makes a very interesting argument. When you go to the, the, the Barnsworth house, mm. uh, the woman, the woman who is facing the woman who is facing the glass walls all around when she washes her dishes, she's facing the sink. So it's an extremely avant-garde gesture about setting you into psychological terror. All of Graham's work is about creating a tension between the psychological character that the architecture constructs and the institutional expectations. So he has to suspend the significance of a certain kind of attention that formal form demands in order to work at a psychological level of the institutional expectations of the character. So I, mean, I don't see how, I mean, I don't think he would Well, you know what my dilemma is, is this, of course, who would like to be categorized? Who would like to be kind of nailed down. You know, you, everybody would like inherently to keep their options open. But, well, and, but then the question is, you know, uh, but, but that means also a cop-out. You know, that means a, a certain either an opportunism or a kind of incompetency of, of stating the principles you're working towards. You want to, you don't believe in them, you don't commit. And the curiosity is, if you say, you know, collage was overcome, was superseded. All the positives of collage are folded within the parameterist uh, no, uh, agenda, so you, it's absorbed. It's not, in a like, it's not like a historian, I have to say. You're not a historian. Is it, <laughs> is it, I don't think. Is it possible that the principle is a contradiction in possibilities? That it's not a matter of picking red because you don't like blue, but because the juxtaposition of red and blue. <laughs> This is, this is the issue that, 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 that he mentioned, Wittgenstein, which is an easy one. It's not so easily transmutatable to architecture. But, but you make this, this a kind of ethical decision that you alone or you and your team have committed to something that other people who are interested in the possibility of options or different perspectives are equivocal, not so ethical, not so committal. So the truth is with the committal, who happens to be you. But but if but if no, the, I'm just in I'm just observing. Wait, 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 wait. And, I mean, it's, so it's many so, people, many many people. Okay, they just you euphemistically, not <laughs> you personally. And and if. If it's possible that, that the contradiction, I mean, you're arguing for a dialectic. A dialectic means intrinsic to the operation that there's a contradiction in it, meaning a suspicion in it. You don't make something new if you're satisfied with the condition that exists. So to do what you consider to be now with all the labels, the avant-garde, but whatever it is, it could be Rimbaud or Baudelaire, could be Bartok, but whatever it is, what your ear hears or what your eye sees might be different than what somebody else hears or sees. So the need to make it in a different way originates there, meaning with a, with, a, with a fundamental dissatisfaction. I think that's where your work started. But the dissatisfaction quotient went away, and now it's a kind of, it's, it's more of a confirmation argument. Well, it's a dialectic of confirmation of certain achievements, certain decisions you've made, and then you open up a new set of further now decisions and questions, but they are on the back of or on top of what you've settled. I mean, in an evolution, for instance. An evolution is, nine, you know, the, the genetic code is 95% reproduction. And if it wasn't that, and if you start, start from zero, 
uh, you would still be in, a, in the era of the but bacteria. what's the analogy to architecture? <laughs> I mean, that's interesting about it. And what's the, uh, what's the analogy to your practice? The whole, Ge the, the genetic code is, architectural practice is... It's the, what I call the, I call the um, on the one hand, the permanent communication structure of the discipline, which are the same for 500 years, which sets up architecture's autopoetic uh, system with self-organizing forward drive. In, in words? In, 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 in images? Distinction, in distinction, no, in distinction to just vernacular construction based on routine repetition of what was always known and always and never questioned. We have a kind of self-consciously, self-critical uh, discourse which takes on that domain. But, and then the next level of semi-permanence, that's permanence, the semi-permanence is the style where for a period, not for eternity, but also not only for a season, you hold steady and build cumulatively a project yes, which, yes. which, which, and the problem is this, we have not, we have to hold steady for another 10 years because what's going on out there in China is still 95% modernism and 10% neoclassicism and minimalism. So, so we, we, otherwise we'll never, we had the crisis of modernism, we're never producing something I don't know how, new. I mean, China is a completely different discussion. Are you saying the kind of pluralistic ideology, the sociology, the liberal sociology that you're an advocate of, is the contemporary condition in China? Is that what you're saying? Are you yes. building a, a sociology in China that belongs to something Absolutely. that's in? That's that's the world I, of China now. I, I do believe that. Yeah. You're yeah. making that world. You're bringing it, it. It's coming to pass, or it's there, and you're ratifying it. I think China is part of the world society. The the, the <laughs> ongoing the structures, the social networking, yeah, the the. They're competing on a very high level in, with the urban environments on the international scene. So they have arrived and they are ready for parametricism and they start to embrace it and work with it. But at the same time, as I said, 95% of production, you, had very, you haven't arrived yet. And if you don't stay tenacious and, and insist that everybody who is a brain and, 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 and a talent in architecture is helping this, we haven't replaced modernism. It's still going on out there. And we are still kind of in the era of early adopters uh, in, 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 in the semi-marginalized avant-garde. And the, and the problem I have is that the economic crisis for the last two years kind of nearly dissuaded uh, th th this project to kind of take on the next level. That's where I think the balance needs to be struck. Um, gotcha. And I think, again, it's the permanent communication structures of architecture and then the semi-permanent uh, heuristics of a style which then allow innovation and radical experiment with each new project on the back of that. Like the evolution is not starting from scratch, it's kind of highly evolved organisms or social, uh, society as such develops out of this. And I think one last point, what is important, do you think for instance that in the wo contemporary world society with social media, with, with the need to innovate uh, technologically and, and take on ecological challenges and all the rest of it, uh, that, there, that there isn't a kind of state-of-the-art best practice for the political system, which no. is competitively well, I think that, developed. I, I think I'm that, saying liberal I think that's democracy. A I think that's a liberal horror democracy. story. And I, think, I think you've subscribed to every contemporary fashion Social media. I mean, we could have a long discussion about yeah. social media. When you sign up, I don't know about you, but I don't want to say whether I'm committed or not. It doesn't define me sociologically. There are a lot of problems with social media. You walk into Tiananmen Square, every time I walk in there, I got to go through a security detector. I haven't found the sociology, in, I found a lot of things in China worth talking about, but not in the terms you're describing the world of China which is a world in motion, it's not so clear where it's going. You just talked a few minutes ago about Mubarak. Everybody knows about Mubarak. Were you saying that two months ago? I, I don't think so. Two months ago, and I know now that, for instance, if ch ch the political system in China is an anachronism and needs to go through a reform process for this society to keep growing, for the economy to keep flourishing, the same as they are, I would say they, they are kind of in the competitive experimentation struggle f emerges and you should look for 
emergent back press best practice in each of these function systems. So there is, as far as I know, no proper alternative for proper multi-party rule of law, democrat democratic, constituted political process to deliver the next stage of this civilization there in society. And there may and not the be. There may not be. And I'm saying. So this, let's not this say this is the way. There may not be a way to address those. Th I would, would propose that this is the way. And in parallel, I would say parametricism is, is, is this kind of state of the art best practice with the best potential which deserves to be, which embeds certain principles and certain insights which have already sustained themselves in an avant garde discourse. And that's the way you got to deliver the urban environments, the built environments, the design for these most advanced societies. They have to introduce liberal democracy, they have to introduce parametricist city planning and architecture, they have to introduce certain uh, state-of-the-art scientific um, uh, discourses and loops of reflection, and they have to have a sophisticated um, um, uh, philosophy of science and epistemological consciousness to do the next level of these projects. I mean, that's that's where, where these parallels are important. And, and you can't, um, um, I think, for me, that's pretty compelling. Patrick, I think Maybe so. we should. We should yeah. uh, uh, one question here. Yeah. Uh, I just want to yeah. just make one real quick point, because I think it's interesting that you're talking about politics and the discussion is going there. But I think there's one thing to talk about what will enable architecture, and there's another thing which I think you're trying to argue in the book how architecture can enable. And I think maybe for the discussion about architecture, it would be interesting, the similar references, the socio-cybernetic stuff, yep. was the same kind of inferences for people like Cedric Price. And they yep. had a certain kind of form of systemic practice, which obviously is radically different from yours, but in a certain sense shared a certain commonality. So it seems the, the accountability and the trajectory has to be argued through the architectural project. And because in another word, I mean, it seems that a lot of the references that you're talking about, Cedric Price would argue for and try to formalize in a project like Fun Palace or through participatory kinds of ideas embedding that structure. So it just seems like it becomes very important and I think before it sort of evolves into everything and all discussion, how architecture reframes the problem. Because that's where I think the discussion about architecture as a form of inquiry becomes very important. And then if the constraints become the means and the tools to actually deliver new mediums and new ideas of what that could be or not. But I think it's kind of important because otherwise if we just go into all of the different kinds of social struggles that are happening of today, I mean, that was prior, you know, your book is not really just discussing that stuff, it's trying to argue how architecture in any shape or form can participate. I mean, I'd, I'd probably leave it at this, but it just seems like it's important to return to architecture in a certain sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so I, I, have a, I have a question. Okay. I think that uh, if the end of architecture is always near, uh, the, the kind of arguments presented here can be a good measure towards the end of an architect or at least the end of an architectural project. Uh, one reason is because uh, I don't believe in history written in the present tense uh, that clearly spells out, spells out or encapsulates uh, the, the end or, or the self-declared bankruptcy of an avant-garde project. I'm surprised with the low level of criticism that has gone uh, back at these arguments uh, because certainly uh, uh, the, 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 the kind of reaction it deserves is uh, uh, a lot stronger. I think that uh, a couple of uh, questions uh, have been put in a much too friendly way. Um, Can you stand up? Who's talking? I, I'm talking. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, one of, one of these questions, or actually one of these points was that the last attempt at a unified theory had been uh, Hegel's uh, uh, thesis. Um, I think that we can find another parallel in uh, Bertrand Russell's uh, uh, Principia Mathematica and uh, the way in which that attempt at a unified theory contained the seed of its own negation. Uh, so 
just like Kurt Gödel managed to uh, pull out pull out the seed pull out the seed of, of that of that self negation, I think that a lot of I think that a lot of material has been is being provided here for the negation of, of the arguments uh, being presented, and I think it would be a, a very productive discussion if we addressed uh, some of those points. <laughs> the, I just, I just, I just, put, I just put one point to you that history, history is not, history is not written in the present sense. Yes. History. <laughs> here it is. History is not written in the present tense. I think that. It's always written I in think the present tense. <laughs> no, there was not. <laughs> there was not. <laughs> It was not devastating. It's not intended to be devastating. I know, but you accused us of not being adequately um, uh, mean. Hey, let me tell you something. All I care about is a dead enemy. Okay, I don't care. It doesn't. You don't have to shoot him with a bazooka. You feed him too much. So don't worry. We're done. We're well, okay. We are talking. We are talking about dead ends here. We're talking about a, a sort of in, encapsulate, encapsulation, a, a self-declared encapsulation of an avant-garde project. Isn't that a dead end? Uh, well, I mean, uh, my answer for Patrick would be completely aware of that possible trap. I have the courage to try it again. And I think that's what's really interesting. I mean, frankly, it's so easy to dismiss it on uh, metacritical terms that and not take seriously its conjectures that then it becomes a complete waste of time. I think problems. we should take it very seriously and I think that and that's precisely why I brought up the point of the critical reaction to some of the arguments being presented here. I think that if we do take it seriously then we certainly have to uh, criticize it seriously uh, to, to question the entire uh, initiative of uh, writing history <coughs> in the terms that it's being attempted here. Uh, so you would like a taboo for any effort whatsoever based on your all prior efforts failures? No, I would not That's like exactly a taboo. What you just said. I would not like a taboo. Just I would like I would the very enterprise no. of trying this no. is something that should be criticized before it even gets tried. That's Cri exactly what you just said. A taboo is not a criticism. A taboo is a preemption of a preemption of that's something. That's right, and that's exactly what you call for. No, history, I call for I call for history, a criticism, not a taboo. History, so history let's, history let's not confuse. Let's not Isn't confuse. That exactly what you no, just let, said? no, it's not exactly what I just said. What, what I said had nothing to do with taboos, and I, right. Okay. Um, I, I don't want to get bogged down in that. Um, I, all, I'm, I'm, all I'm trying to say is that if we have a group of people who is sort of embarked upon a a project of uh, avant garde, then we should. Uh, be discussing uh, the ideas being presented here. But the in problem is truly, uh, Jeff put this nail on, on in your coffin. Uh, you have it's a kind of meta critique, and you haven't come up uh, to redeem your own claims. And to to a certain extent, I would recommend you to go back to the book. It sounds a bit <laughs> arrogant, but um, uh, I don't think you're, you're. I didn't gather from your comments sufficient. Uh, intelligence and coherency to merit further comment. I wouldn't expect I so. I wouldn't <laughs> expect so. I, I also. I will I, and, 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 and take that as a very friendly advice. But uh, you know, Look, but everybody. Uh, uh, but I want to move on. And Thomas is the last. <laughs>